Hello, I'm Ashwin Kadambi and welcome to in Real Life. Earlier this week on April 14th, we marked the World Chagas Disease Day. The World Health Organization has called for comprehensive and equitable access to healthcare and services to everyone who has been affected by Chagas disease. An estimated six to seven million people worldwide are infected by Trypnosoma cruzi, the parasite that causes the disease. Chagas disease is one of the main diseases affecting vulnerable communities in Latin America. Chagas disease is classified in global health as a neglected tropical disease. They mainly affect populations living in poverty and in close contact with infectious vectors. In January of this year, WHO launched its roadmap for neglected tropical diseases, commonly called as NTDs. Um, the title of the roadmap is Ending the Neglect to Attain Sustainable Development Goals, a Roadmap for Neglected Tropical Diseases 2021-2030, which is a high level strategic document and advocacy tool aimed at strengthening programmatic response to NTDs through shared goals and disease specific targets backed by smarter investments. Establishment of public private partnerships has vastly facilitated progress towards the elimination and control of NTDs. In the past decade, pharmaceutical companies have donated nearly 3 billion tablets of safe quality assured medicines annually. Likewise, the involvement of multiple stakeholders has enabled us to come near elimination of elimination or eradication of some of these diseases. These achievements are a testament that there is immense potential that can be unlocked by working in partnership to ensure that eradication of NTDs have a prominent position on the global health agenda. To talk about us and highlight further, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Christina Orling, who is an expert in both private, who is an expert in both public-private partnerships and development of drugs treating some of these NTDs. Let me first welcome my co-hosts, Dr. Helia Gafari and Dr. Maimuna Alex Adiomi. Helia. I think you're on mute. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Helia. I'm a Maryland native, uh, but I've been living in New York City for the last nine years. Uh, I earned my MD PhD in New York at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. My uh, thesis focused on biochemistry of cancer biology and drug discovery. Um, so I'm, right now I'm doing a surgical residency program. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you. We're really glad to have you joining us, Helia. And um, like Ashwin said, we're delighted to be speaking with um, Christina Olin and you know, getting to just hear her expertise and her experience with neglected top, uh, tropical diseases. Dr. Christina Olin has worked more than 15 years with various aspects of pharmaceutical research in a collaborative setting. The past 10 years have been dedicated mainly to the management and communication of interdisciplinary, complex public-private partnerships addressing some of the toughest challenges for global health and well-being, such as IMS gram-negative antibiotics now, the European lead lead factory, and H2020 PDE4 NPDs. She's currently leading Ligature's global health portfolio 
and she holds a PhD in medicinal chemistry and an MSc from chemical engineering. Wow, Christina, with drug research specialization from Uppsala University in Sweden, um, as well as a Magister de Physicochemie from, I need to work on my French, from Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, France, both very well-known and renowned institutions. Her professional experience includes research, marketing, and teaching at Personal Chemistry, also known as Biotage. Sweden and also at Mekadem, also known as Simmeris in Netherlands uh, and VU University Amsterdam. You're welcome, Christina. So we do have a couple of questions for you, but to start with, can you please provide a very broad definition of neglected tropical diseases? Well, first, I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm looking very much uh, forward to our discussion today. Uh, I think it's very inspirational to see today's hosts uh, coming from several corners of the world and getting together for a, a subject that is so important for us all anywhere in the world. So uh, the neglected tropical disease is, uh, is a collective name that was coined in the beginning of this millennium. Uh, it was to m m create awareness for, uh, for the type of uh, health conditions that strikes upon the most vulnerable and most poor people in the world. Um, that's the neglect. And uh, in the tropical, uh, tropical uh, uh, geography, uh, it has been formalized a little bit further by the World Health Organization. Today, they, the they have a list of 20 uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, uh, there's quite a few of them. It's a very disparate list. Uh, it's mainly infectious diseases. Many of them are vector-borne, but it can vector can be insects like, like mosquitoes uh, or flies, uh, snails. Uh, they can be transmitted uh, by air, via the skin. Uh, genital diseases are also included. They affect many different uh, uh, areas uh, in the body. Uh, so eyes, skin, uh, systemic. Uh, and uh, I have to refer to the World Health Organization here uh, or uh, of the full list of the 20 diseases uh, because it would take us uh, maybe five or 10 minutes if I would just name them all. Um, in Collectively, in 2019, they killed 80,000 people. Uh, all around the world, I should say. It's not enormous if you compare to, for example, COVID or uh, the what we often call the, the big three, the HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria that affects hundreds of thousands of people uh, every year. Uh, but when it comes to the, uh, the disease burden and how much it affects the people who are struck with these diseases and the rest of the lives and how it affects their families. Uh, the tally uh, totals up to about 18 million uh, disability uh, uh, adjusted life years. So this is a measure uh, that has been defined uh, to uh, to kind of quantify uh, the burden uh, of a certain disease. Mm, and not only how many deaths, deaths, but also disabilities, for example, not being able to work. Um, so personally, I worked with uh, five of these diseases uh, with human African sleeping sickness, also called trypanosomiasis, Chagas disease that Ashwin uh, was mentioning, 
um, uh, schistosomiasis uh, or bilharzia, um, uh, leishmaniasis, uh, and um, and soil transmitted helminths. Uh, uh, but these are only five out of the 20. But what uh, does it matter, neglected tropical diseases? Uh, when we sit, for me, I'm sitting in Uppsala in Sweden at the moment. Um, I think here the COVID uh, epidemic has really made clear that what happens in a very far corner of the world can affect your personal health in a matter of a few months. We also see that with increased travel around the world, uh, with uh, the climate zones changing, uh, that what once used to be confined to the tropical region now reaches people also in in uh, other parts of the world. Well, thank you for that um, response, Christina. And you really elaborated on the morbidity and mortality related to neglected tropical diseases, which, you know, I like how you really highlighted the disability adjusted life years because somebody else might ask why bother about NTDs if it's only 80,000 but then you're like when you combine those disability adjusted life years then the burden of the disease is actually significant you had mentioned schistosomiasis which causes river blindness and we do know that at, that accounts for a significant portion of blindness and imagine what blindness does to somebody who is within productive working years. They are not able to work, they become a burden to the system, it's a burden to the families and there's a huge cost to that. Um, so I really appreciate you um, highlighting the disability adjusted life years. Um, speaking of partnerships and collaboration, um, on January 30th, 2011, uh, 2012 actually, a couple of stakeholders that include big pharma, donors, you know, endemic countries, NGOs, and some multilateral organizations gathered in London to sign a declaration on neglected tropical diseases. Do you think that declaration has been impactful? Um, if yes, why? And how have they played a role in partnerships and NTDs? I think um, there have been many aspects of this. I think it was an extremely important event, actually. First of all, it brought entities on the agenda of uh, of the of more people, not only the leishmaniacs, for example, as <laughs> the researchers working on leishmania are called, uh, but really also sh giving a precedent. There were many more funders that kind of joined afterwards. Um, and a third point is the accountability, that actually people signed up on this, and that makes that they can be accountable if they withdraw or, does, or don't deliver. And I think that's a very important aspect. And thank, you, thank you, Christina, for reviewing that. Um, so, you know, we, we know I think all, many people know how difficult research can be, but um, I think a lot of progress has been made in, in coming up with drugs to kill the parasite. However, what, what do you think has been the roadblock with, uh, with adequately providing treatment to these, uh, for these NTDs? And can you give us an example of how these partnerships have um, been successful in eradicating an NTD? Well, you know, I just read uh, earlier this week that uh, 33 countries have eliminated at least one NTD. And I mean, that's fantastic. And um, I think highlighting just one of them would be difficult. If, because they all there are so many different diseases, they have so many different aspects. The the different countries have had different approaches. 
but it show that means that can be done for an array of different cultures, for an array of different NTDs. It can. I think there are many roadblocks, and that also depends on the disease. In for some diseases, uh, you see that there's um, really not any adequate drugs. For example, for uh, the East African variant of uh, human African trypanosomiasis, the only actual treatment is an arsenic drugs. And everybody who has read Agatha Christie knows that arsenic drugs or arsenic is extremely poisonous. So five to 10% of the patients die from the treatment. And but if they don't take it, if they have the um, um, if it's gone into the central nervous system, the parasites that enter the central nervous system, they will die nonetheless. Um, in other cases, uh, there are good uh, drugs with, with not too many side effects, uh, but it's difficult to diagnose the patients properly. Um, and in other cases, it's just extremely difficult to get the uh, right drug to the patients that access is the biggest issue. So uh, there are many roadblocks. I think organizations like uh, 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 the Drugs for Neglected Diseases um, have been very successful in bringing new drugs. Uh, they have been focused on drug discovery and drug development. Um, and now we see it's same thing with malaria, uh, medicines for malaria uh, venture. Uh, and we see these uh, product development partnerships that they are focusing more and more on access. Um, and here, uh, I think this is really good. And also the acceptance uh, of the drug in the different communities. Thank you for going over that. That's it's really interesting about not only is there diversity in the types of the parasites and the bacteria, but there's also diversity in the communities and um, and that it, it sh shows how that's um, definitely impacted the ability to treat and diagnose people. Um, however, I can imagine that when there is when those communities um, they're like also take part in in the treatment um, that, that there can be success. So can you talk about some of the micro planning mm -hmm. strategies that have been successful and um, and that have and then the, how those strategies have been applied uh, to other diseases? Uh, I, I should say that it's extremely important to work uh, both bottom up, I mean, on the grassroots levels, and also uh, top down, work on uh, governments, uh, ministries of health, regulatory uh, um, agencies to get that solidity and the, the acceptance. It has to come from both, both ends. I should say that my uh, my work is very focused on drug discovery and drug development, uh, where we, and I haven't been so much involved in uh, the access part, uh, but I can say some, this is not really for neglected tropical diseases, but I, uh, I know that for example, access to improve access to a malaria medicine, um, they combine, they, uh, uh, they, joint efforts uh, with uh, the programs delivering HIV uh, treatments where they had a bicycle they have bicycle uh, deliveries uh, and then the same uh, ladies who were cycling out to the villages uh, also brought the drugs for malaria uh, mm. where the in those areas where you had and in the, the times of the year uh, where you had both HIV and, and malaria. Uh, 
So I think uh, this is extremely important that we, uh, it's an area where we have very little uh, resources, both in terms of money, uh, educated uh, healthcare workers, uh, and, we, and time actually as well. Uh, and I think it, it's extremely important that we try to piggyback on each other, you know, help each other um, with small things. It can be, for example, um, that uh, make that uh, if a study is run for one disease, we know that there's another disease prevalent in the same area to see how we can share vehicles, for example, uh, just to collect samples and meet the patients, these type of things. Um, I think you touched on a really important point, though, that it's, um, you know, it, it goes beyond just coming up with the drugs. I, as someone also in drug discovery, it's, it's almost like that's, I, I hesitate to use the term easy because that part's not easy, but just because you have a drug doesn't necessarily mean you have a cure because a cure also means being able to get, um, get it to people. Um, so, but that's really cool how they were able, you're able to partner up with the HIV um, delivery system. So, very cool. Mm -hmm. And I think what you mentioned now, that just because you have a drug doesn't mean you have a treatment. Um, uh, Ligature, the organization I'm working for, uh, we're also driving a big uh, project on Prosecantel, which is one of the most common anti-warming agents. Um, it's a company, Merck, who has developed this. Uh, and what they noticed was that despite uh, years of, uh, of do uh, donating and making sure that um, uh, people, mostly young students or young children, uh, got the drugs, uh, the prevalence, uh, there was an unsatisfactory um, decrease in prevalence of schistosomiasis um, in many regions. And what they realized was that the pills uh, that Prostate Cantel comes in are too big for many children to swallow, mm -hmm. and it has a really foul, bitter taste. So the project that we're running at the moment, it's uh, to make a new drug. It's the same uh, active uh, ingredient, the pharmaceutical ingredient is the same, Prosecantel, but it's uh, now in pills that are suitable for, for children, and it tastes much better. So this will mean that it it will be much easier to convince the children to take the pill. Um, related to this, we're also working on a project where we're uh, where, uh, we're helping developing a new tool to better understand the prevalence, a diagnostic tool using artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, where we rely less on very highly educated microscopists and, and uh, parasitologists. Uh, this project is extremely exciting because there are two big pharmaceutical companies, uh, Merck and Janssen, have, mm -hmm. uh, are working together. This is about piggybacking because Janssen, they are developing or they have uh, treatments for soil transmitted helminths, uh, which are worms, mm -hmm. intestinal worms, basically. Uh, and actually, the, the, you can diagnose that in the same way as schistosomiasis. So here, combining forces uh, and um, to develop better methods to really evaluate the effect of the treatments. I think this is a really nice example, and I think this will have an enormous impact on health in, in the endemic areas. You were just joining us now. We are talking with Dr. Christina Orling on the importance of public and private partnerships 
towards ending neglected tropical diseases. Back to you, Hylia. Um, <clears throat> so the you, you mentioned a lot about the about these diseases and the, the mechanisms also of how they're transmitted. Can you also talk a bit about like preventive mechanisms? You know, you mentioned with the dirt and a big reason why these um, NTDs hit hit these areas is because they're correlated with socioeconomics. Could you um, talk, I, I know your expertise in drug discovery, but are you aware of any like partnerships with it? it I think an issue sometimes is the, there's not much incentive for prevention for pharmaceutical companies, but do you know of any partnerships involved in prevention as well as treatment? Um, I think the best prevention in general is um, to prevent political conflict. Uh, for example, there's been a really close uh, um, uh, correlation between political unrest of war and human African trypanosomiasis. Um, so I think this just underlines uh, that collaboration is usually the best tool against uh, conflict, um, at least um, the, the type of disruptive conflict uh, that lead to war. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I cannot give a really good uh, example on the top of my head. I will probably come up with it when we're when this discussion is over uh, of other prevented measures. But um, we know, I mean, there's many uh, important activities going uh, ongoing for better sanitation and uh, and uh, water uh, purity. Uh, this is really key. Um, we see also, for example, that uh, high, I mean, water and hygiene uh, is uh, really strongly correlated uh, with uh, the spread of infectious diseases, neglected tropical diseases uh, in particular, uh, and, and health in general. In terms of um, um, in terms of the role of ministries of health um, in partnership, how can targeted programs be integrated with within national health systems, including that in the national health agenda, to continue sustainable care? At this moment, you know, I see the we see that the these public private partnerships are mostly international, but to ensure that they are sustainable, they need to be really locally driven. So how can we kind of translate that success and accomplishment in the international stage to a local, um, local sustainable, um, sustained accomplishment? Yeah, I, I could not agree more uh, with you. Uh, I think it's extremely important that the countries that are effective also take ownership on this. Uh, I think in some cases, this is maybe a little bit controversial to say, but donations and my, at least a reliance on donations uh, will impair empowerment. I think it's really important uh, that, uh, that uh, local researchers are involved. Uh, and also that uh, there should be mechanisms of educational programs that we have people from uh, local people being trained. Um, I think here also it's important to consider the grassroots. Remember the children of the grassroots are the, the future of, or the future leaders. If you see who's leading, yeah, it's it's mostly the children and the next generation. Uh, so in terms of like uh, misconceptions about neglected tropical disease, what do you see as the major misconception in the global health community um, within our own community when it comes to addressing 
or understanding neglected tropical diseases? I think uh, maybe, yeah, this is very biased, of course. I think the importance of partnership is, is really, really important. Uh, I think that is also something that the World Health Organization could have uh, pushed a little bit more on, highlighted more uh, in their uh, new agenda for 2030. Um, in their, um, the World Health Organization, uh, as Ashwin mentioned, has uh, then announced a new roadmap for 2030. I could, they, I think they. Sh uh, could have pushed it more and also it doesn't have to be the really big partnerships i think like the london declaration i think that's important it's good uh, but it's a uh, the small partnerships are also important uh, i'm really happy to see more and more uh, what we call south south uh, interaction uh, where you have knowledge exchange uh, and um, you know, a drive uh, within the endemic areas, and all, um, with exchange of researchers, uh, etc. I think that's really important and really fun and inspiring to see. Yeah, it's nice that you talked about the South-South partnership. So, how can we like bring those fresh approaches to resource mobilization? so that some of these research is supported locally, local university students and scholars are supported locally um, to ensure they work on these particular, uh, uh, particular diseases. I th I'm always amazed when I speak uh, with the young researchers uh, or uh, also technicians, uh, from the endemic areas, how knowledgeable they are. And they know their communities so much better uh, um, than I do. And most of the researchers, uh, or many of the researchers in the West. Uh, and um, I think also, um, it, people were very open for suggestions. Uh, and I think uh, that is also very inspiring. Uh, I, yeah, it's a true joy to see. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, no, uh, so, yeah, definitely. But uh, in terms of like local uh, part, local philanthropy, how can we like drive that local philanthropy to support, um, you know, uh, research that is conducted like like within the countries where. Um, the, the these diseases are endemic. Yeah, I think there, as with all many things, there must be a pull and a push. Uh, and uh, if we take the disease just the semiasis, for example, yeah. uh, I think uh, from a national economic viewpoint, uh, just semiasis has a big effect because we were talking about these disability adjusted uh, life years, uh, um, but that's just one part of it. What you've seen, for example, is that children that are heavily infected with cystosomiasis at young age, they perform worse in school, uh, they are later assessed with a lower average IQ, and have a lower uh, salaries or lower earnings. So you can see that if you can eradicate, for example, uh, this parasite, you increase the educational level of your population and has a big chance to increase the brutal national product of that nation. So, uh, and I think it's really important that you uh, uh, that uh, you have knowledge exchange, that you let people uh, like yourselves um, um, 
come to to West, uh, learn really solid uh, yeah. research practice. But it's also yeah. m much important that it's attractive for masters, uh, master of science uh, mm -hmm. students and PhD students to return uh, to their countries and continue that uh, knowledge exchange. Right, but I guess, uh, I believe, Christina, I read a uh, magazine interview of you a couple of years ago, and you had you had been doing malaria research back then. And you had answered in that interview that, you know, funding for tropical diseases are a bit of a constraint for students who are interested in neglected tropical diseases. How has it changed after a decade or two decades uh, since your interview um, in, in today's world? How has that funding stream gone up or gone down? What's the status now? What can you say about it now? Uh, I think it has been, it, it did increase. Uh, I don't have any numbers, but my sense is that it did increase after uh, the London 2012 uh, declaration. There were more money streams going into it. There were also a bigger incentive for the pharmaceutical companies to continue supporting these programs uh, and doing research, uh, such as uh, the ones that I mentioned with Merck and Janssen, if they, even if they have really old drugs, both Prosecontel and Mebendazole are really old drugs, but they uh, continue uh, seeing how their treatments can be more effective, and for that they need research. And for that they need researchers with a local knowledge. Um, uh, it could be more. I mean, if you compare uh, the funding uh, for very rare cancers, compared to uh, all the neglected diseases. I mean, it's still still just fractions of it. Um, so uh, there's still to be, we need to continue the momentum to raise the awareness of the neglected tropical diseases. Uh, and I think it's really good actually to talk about them despite their diversity and to dis to have this label because it makes it so much easier to create that cr uh, critical mass of number of cases and uh, it's much easier to remember neglected tropical diseases than the difficult names of Beruli ulcer and uh, all these exotic yeah. names. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, exactly. And in terms of, uh, before I uh, let uh, Maimon or Helia ask a question, uh, in terms of, uh, you talked a little bit about AI. So these public-private partnerships, technology companies have a role as well um, with the advent of advanced, uh, um, the, the role of technology in our lives every day. And even in low and middle-income communities, uh, whether they have a bathroom or not, there's uh, access to cell phone. So how can mm -hmm. we leverage the power of technology to kind of, um, uh, you know, address these issues? And you already touched about one or two areas, if you can just expand on that. Yeah, I think there's uh, enormous potential, I must say. I mean, and it also shows how you can do leaps in technology. Why can't we do that in health technology as well? I mean, basically, uh, the leap when it comes to uh, telecom was uh, not to make a lot of landlines, but you went from quite uh, rudimental uh, telecommunication to, to 3G in one leap, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is uh, lots of possibilities here. Also using artificial intelligence uh, for, for, for example, mapping 
uh, mapping um, uh, the, the disease burden uh, and do more precise, personalized, so, so to call uh, 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 medicines and treatments. Um, Dr. Erling, I, I really appreciate you talking about the importance of finance and funding. Uh, as a recent graduate I, at, at Sinai, I, I really, I've seen firsthand the effects that funding can really make or break something promising. And it, sometimes it can be quite tragic because it doesn't seem to necessarily be a response to what the potential of something is. Um, as much as it's of an interest. Uh, so I really appreciate talking about that because I've seen students who've had to completely switch projects um, because of lack of funding. And it's also interesting you mentioned this about technology and how quickly we've been able to, you know, put the whole world in our palm. <laughs> but if you walk around a hospital, I mean, doctors are still using pagers. Um, and then the way, you know, a lot of times, Patients even ask, like, how do you not have a treatment for this? Or isn't there a better method to do this? And um, I think as a, this is maybe more of a universal issue, but I'm, I'm curious what, um, what your experience has been in, in these um, uh, smaller uh, communities. But sometimes it's, there's this attitude of, um, well, it works fine right now. And there isn't really think, this drive for change. We should remember that the whole uh, public health and uh, pharmaceutical industry, um, of public health sector and pharmaceutical industry is extremely um, conservative uh, for many good reasons as well. Because uh, it's not like you're downloading your app and looking the terms and conditions you don't really read them you just say okay everybody else has downloaded this I press check <laughs> but here we're talking about when it comes to data extremely sensitive uh, potentially extremely sensitive data uh, it might affect your insurance it might affect if it comes in the wrong hands maybe even your possibility to get a mortgage or a loan in some parts of the world um, and uh, and also, if you develop a drug or a vaccine uh, or a treatment too fast uh, and don't do the necessary checks that it's really safe, it can go awfully bad. And it can affect uh, not only this treatment uh, and the people who suffer from those side effects, but it might also affect the trust of general people in taking a drug at all or, or getting a jab, for example. We see the whole uh, anti-vax uh, community um, with, um, that might affect global health more than anybody knows uh, because of how not taking your vaccines can can has an effect on uh, propagating uh, antimicrobial resistance. One of my other pet uh, pet interests, um, which might revert us back to the Middle Ages when it comes to treat normal infection infections such as uh, urinary tract infection or simple ulcers like wounds. Um, so there is a reason for the uh, to be conservative, but uh, there is many reasons why uh, we should try to engage also the big technology companies uh, and support um, development for better health. Thank you for that response, Christina. Um, so for anyone just joining us, we are speaking with um, the delightful Dr. Christina Orlin on partnerships, the key to ending neglected tropical diseases. So please feel free to send in your comments, questions um, that we can field um, to Christina. 
Um, first of all, I also want to correct um, a previous error where I mentioned river blindness and schistosomiasis. So river blindness is actually caused by Onchoceca volvulus, which is onchocecaiasis. Yes, my professors will be very mad if I mix that up. Um, and then um, speaking of um, partnerships, advocacy for you know neglected illnesses or global health in general, Surgery used to be called, or I think it probably is still called, the neglected stepchild of global health. So what a couple of um, advocates and researchers in global surgery did was they came up with this, um, it's, it's like the Lancet Global Surgery 2030 roadmap. And they also estimated the economic burden of not doing anything in global surgery. And it was estimated that you know low and middle income countries where there was a huge burden on global surgery, would record economic losses of as much as $12.3 billion if there weren't interventions in areas that they had highlighted. So are you aware of any work like this in neglected tropical diseases where somebody is trying to basically quantify the cost or the economic burden of not doing anything? Uh, I think there have been many attempts. Um, I should. I mentioned a number before: the eighty thousand uh, people killed by neg neglected tropical diseases. Uh, but one of the complications here, in any way of quantification, oh sorry, is my minute. You're on mute, or I can't see what you're saying. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead, Christina. <laughs> um, is that uh, it's uh, just because of logistics uh, it's extremely difficult to make estimations uh, even on number of, of uh, people killed I mean that's maybe one of the best numbers most reliable numbers but these are still estimates and um, then you have the estimate of uh, of dailies, for example, that we were talking about before. I mean, what is actually the burden, not only on in terms of morbidity, well, sorry, mortality, but also morbidity. Uh, and then you try to put a, a price tag on each uh, daily. Uh, so I'd rather not to mention any sum here because I think it it yes there are so many uh, factors that could could change that uh, that range thank you christina um of course the ntd roadmaps mentioned cross-cutting partnerships um and you know as as one of these strategies to ensure that you know you can get to the goals and the objectives that have been laid out do you think there are any lessons learned from the big three that you mentioned earlier, HIV, AIDS, malaria, TB, that we can um, take as we try to implement, advocate for, and um, you know, support just the NTD 2021-2030 road, uh, roadmap? I think one of the things um, that these three uh, communities uh, who are working in these three diseases have managed to do is to um, to to form um, alliances and pretty strong communities. I think this has been really important. Uh, of these, have different uh, product development partnerships uh, formed. For example, the Medicines for Malaria Venture that I mentioned earlier, the TB Alliance, for example. Um, and uh, I, I think this has been really important. I think M Medicines for Malaria Venture have. Uh, really created uh, quite a few new drugs that are much better that uh, the uh, artesanoate uh, based uh, uh, combination treatments ACTs uh, that have made reduced the number of malaria cases quite a lot but you also see for example malaria is a vector borne disease it's, uh, it's um, transmitted um, by, by mosquitoes, 
And also the distribution of bed nets, for example, have been a very important for er eradication or close eradication in, in many areas. So this uh, working on several aspects of around the disease and how you can prevent it uh, and how you can treat treat acute cases ha have been have worked very effectively. Um, I, uh, so that's one point. I think also I should say that cross-sector partnerships uh, is not always so straightforward. And luckily for me, because otherwise I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but it also takes a little bit. I mean, it takes effort because you have to make compromises. Uh, you typically have some kind of diplomatic uh, or democratic uh, um, decision order uh, that serves uh, that yeah that need that requires some some degree of diplomacy um, and uh, there are a few things uh, that I see as cornerstones to good partnerships uh, for example uh, that you have a strong governance or clear governance structure uh, this means that you know who's taking what decision and who to elevate if you escalate um, issues to. Uh, I think this is one way to create trust in each other, in the process and in the approach and, object, pro, uh, approach and objectives of your project. Um, and it's good to have an infrastructure around it to, to also see, you know, we talked about uh, telecom and information technology that you, you know how to be able to communicate and how you can reach people and know who knows what is also very, very important. Thing I think is uh, very important is good communication and it's communication within the partnership, uh, with the diff between the different members, but also towards your stakeholders and towards your funders. And the stakeholders, is, it's, you know, it's a buzzword, more or less, but the stakeholders, uh, those are also the patients, but their families and the frontline healthcare workers, um, but also the Ministry of Health, for example, or that are, that are involved. We do have uh, one or two uh, comments. Um, so here uh, we have a question from Danima. Uh, so he says, uh, you spoke of leveraging pharmaceutical companies to fund research technology companies to assist in awareness and also having locally affected countries to increase education and their stake in the response of to NTDs. If you had to choose one place for us as a global community to focus on to have largest impact, what would that be? So I guess the commenter is interested in uh, what might be like you can talk about what one sector must do better in 2021. Uh, you know, when I saw the word place, I think uh, my the first word that pops up to my mind is education. We won't solve entities within, not with my my generation, uh, but we have to make sure that the next generation knows about it, understands why these diseases occur and how you can prevent them. Um, and um, because I don't want to single out one sector. I mean, there are players in each sector in the pharmaceutical industry. There are um, uh, government uh, officials, agencies, NGOs, uh, tech uh, people in the tech business that are doing an amazing job. Sure. Um, but yeah, uh, there can always be more. <laughs> Let's yeah. work on the next generation. 
absolutely uh, that was uh, i believe uh, really quite a diplomatic answer and uh, so like that uh, <laughs> if you can uh, share some leadership qualities and lessons you have learned in your life that young global health and public health professionals can model uh, what are some you can share from your from your life yeah so i think there are very many different leadership styles and i think my best advice would be be true to yourself mm-hmm. uh, and s- stay close to your qualities i mean you always it's always uh, good to know what to be better on or to, what to tune down uh, to reflect on things that didn't work but also reflect on the things that did work in collaborations when you collaborate uh, you always have to uh, you always have to be prepared for compromises but there are also compromises that you wouldn't you cannot do i mean we're talking about things like corruption or abuse um yeah. both of power but also for example sexual abuse these are things that we that you cannot compromise and i think it's good to to make up your mind early on um to strengthen your integrity what are things that you don't uh, that you that you cannot <laughs> work with i mean live with uh, and um and then i think it's always good to try to think about if something if you disagree with something or if there is an uh, issue to solve to think about well how does that party see this how would i see it if i was standing in his or her shoes uh and how does the other part a uh, party uh, see it i think uh, that makes it makes it easier to understand how people are acting in a certain situation um and at l- i think often if you have a little bit more understanding for um if people are in in cases where people are overreacting uh for what the background to it it often helps you oversee it um and not get uh, and not uh, not be um, upset about yeah. it i need to work on it uh, dr orling so i don't know yes we have one uh, comment from uh, in so marius uh, so burli also endemic in developing countries had significantly progressed in terms of case detection yet control of activities and improved resource allocation is needed how can resource be mobilized yes i think um we talked early on on accountability and uh bruli also is uh is certainly one of the more neglected of the neglected diseases i see it um and uh and here the need has been very long uh better diagnostics uh and i think here there's just a lack of that uh of the communication um uh, i think uh, there's maybe the word of the recent uh progress has not uh, reached the people who might uh sit on the funds and resources to distribute it um i don't have a better answer than that uh but communication is extremely important things like this this initiative just raising the awareness dr rolling can you um, actually tell us a little bit about yourself and what if there are any experiences you had growing up that drove or inspired you to do what you're doing today um so <laughs> um 
when I was working with malaria, uh, uh, I was always thinking that because I'm born in the very north of Sweden, which is, I maybe you're not aware of it, but it's, the, it's swamped with mosquitoes in the summertime. Uh, so it's dark and cold or win all winter. And, and so summertime, you really want to be outdoors, but it's just like clouds of biting mosquitoes. I never would so have I thought imagined maybe this that was, at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe I'm not uh, giving a very good, uh, maybe the tourist agency of Northern Sweden will hate me now, but it it is extremely beautiful if you have good <laughs> mosquito repellent. <laughs> but maybe this was the reason, uh, uh, um, people were joking me with me that maybe this was the reason why I went into malaria. But I think, uh, actually, when I was a child, I really liked building things. Uh, I always, as a teenager, I thought I would be an architect. In the end, I became a kind of molecular architect uh, doing design of, of uh, small molecules, so putting atoms together. Uh, in the right way to to dock into to attach yourself to the disease generating protein, uh, and now I still see that I'm look I'm doing building I'm building consortia I'm building partnerships I think about well what type of uh, of block do we need to what get how can we fill this gap how can we make this construction stronger, um, so. Uh, uh, but I think also uh, I really enjoy working with people from different cultures. I love good food from all over the place. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it uh, it's given me really a lot personally uh, to work in this area. Extremely rewarding, extremely nice people to work with who puts collaboration in front of uh, competition. Thank that's, you so much. Uh, no, go ahead, Helia. I say that that's just a really beautiful comment to talk about because I, I mean, as a Persian American, that's something, um, you know, when we talk about the NTDs and these endemic areas, we just have this one dimensional image of them. Um, and I think that's, you know, as a Persian American, I feel that way with the news, but you mentioned food and that's always been a, a place where I feel like these food is, I feel like the almost always the center of these collaborations and building bridges between people. So that's a, I mean, it's the, the what's beautiful is what drove you to do this is, is the cultures and the people. So um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I also, definitely like that. Go ahead, Christina. Uh, it's interesting, you know, you meet people from very different cultures. You have very different approaches. I'm, I, I'm born in Sweden. I lived in the Netherlands, which are very blunt and, you know, very direct. And then uh, we can interact with Asians who are kind of the opposite. But in the end, first of all, we have... We, we, I think you find people who have the same drive, who, who have, uh, who, who really care about people, uh, about patients, putting patients in the center, um, but also people of people all over the world. Uh, we have the same basic. Uh, uh, drives and and that's so rewarding to see yeah no i think just uh you know piggybacking off of what helia said it that's so beautiful to hear and you know at the end of the day like you said christina for the most part we all want the same things we just have different parts of getting there or we're all competing for the same resources but we all want the same things so thank you for sharing that um we do have an audience question that I want to make sure that I take. And I think it's important because earlier on when we had asked about one thing you would focus on, 
you you mentioned um, you know educating the next generation to understand why we have the diseases and also in very quick response what kind of steps or measures would help the public to protect themselves from neglected tropical diseases knowing that more, most of the time it's vector transmission very quick response what kind of steps or measures <laughs> Yeah, so we were talking about uh, water. Uh, I mean, hygiene, sanity is uh, is very, very uh, important. I'm, I'm very aware of that in many communities uh, to have access to running water uh, or pure water even is difficult. Um, uh, but in other areas to really make sure that uh, you separate, um, how should I say, water used for cleaning, uh, water used for for food, that it's separated. That's very uh, and sanitation are very important. Um, and in other cases, uh, for example, we mentioned vector-borne diseases, uh, bed nets, etc. Protective clothing, very important. I also learned when I was working with trypanosomiasis that you should not wear the color blue on your safari. Ooh. Because the uh, the uh, fly is, uh, that sets a fly at, is attracted to the color blue. Interesting. <laughs> Thank um, you for sharing those very practical tips, um, Christina. Um, for anyone just joining us, We've been speaking with the lovely Christina Orlin, an expert in neglected tropical diseases, and we've been highlighting partnerships as the key to ending neglected tropical diseases. Um, so as we just look towards wrapping up, because we're like six minutes past the hour now, um, we've really focused, and Christina has shared on, you know, the role of partnerships, um, trying to make sure that, you know, even within partnerships, identifying different stakeholders, identifying the different needs, and trying to find areas of aligned interest and collaboration talked about um, you know preventative and not just curative health but also preventative health after all we are talking about pub, um, public health and global health we also highlighted just understanding neglected tropical diseases and what the world health organization has done in terms of getting stakeholders together um, coming together with a community and signing a de declaration in 2012 and then recently coming on with the roadmap of 2021 to 2030, highlighting how to end neglected tropical diseases. So before we wrap up um, and before, I, I don't know, before we take any audience questions, I will just hand over to my co-moderators for any lingering questions or any final thoughts. Oh, we are good. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. This was uh, an enlightening conversation. I learned a lot and it was, uh, uh, we are looking forward to uh, following uh, the great research that you're doing. And um, uh, if you can just share um, a place where people can contact you. Yes, so the best way, um, you can find me on LinkedIn under this name, Christina Orling, uh, or uh, my uh, email address, uh, which is christina.orling at ligature.org. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, I think I, I, I'm a little shameless with interrupting. So all my questions, I, I managed to get them. But again, I wanted to reiterate, like, um, this is an honor being part of this, getting to meet you and hear about uh, what's being the collaborations and partnerships being done to battle on TDs. It's, it's, def, it's um, you know, my, my background is also in drug discovery, but it's, it's always enlightening um, and enriching to see how drug discovery is being used in other fields. And, and also about how it's uh, the similarities. It's very cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And uh, final thoughts, yeah, Tina, before uh, Ramona wraps up. Yeah, so thanks to you for all your good questions. Uh, um, 
and uh, for inviting me today and also to the audience who sent questions <laughs> i see now no more no more blue shirts uh, for the minas yeah uh, good point um and uh yeah i really hope that uh, uh you I, I who are representatives of a young uh, young generation of researchers uh, will carry the torch further i am very excited to to contribute a little bit awesome Thank you so much, Dr. Christina. Um, to my co-moderators, Ashwin and Helia, thank you so much for your very insightful questions, for your candor, for humor. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, like we said, we all want the same thing. So thank you for sharing your very truthful story, your background. I'm sure you're not going to be excommunicated by the government of Northern Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> for <your story>. um, <laughs> There's this very famous um, author from Nigeria, Chimamanda Adichie, and she talks about the dangers of the single story. And I think you alluded to it earlier, Helia, that no one people or one tribe or one place is one thing. The problem is we only often propagate a single story and there's a danger to that. So we should endeavor to share the entire story. So I like how you talked about even the places that have the most that suffer most from neglected tropical diseases are often beautiful places with great food and great culture and and i think that's what we need to embrace about the world and the globe and and who we are as humans thank you so much once again for joining us to our audience we say thank you for being engaging for staying on even though we're 11 minutes past the hour thank you for your very very enlightening questions for anyone joining us, again, we're talking about partnerships, the key to neglecting tropical diseases, and we're chatting with Dr. Christina Orlin. Please follow us, Public Health in Real Life, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on YouTube. Like and subscribe to our channel. Provide feedback on topics, on experts you would like us to interview. Um, we would also be hosting some fireside chats um, where we look to you know, bring people who are also you know, experts in their field or emerging experts. So please stay tuned for all of that great content. Um, thank you all so much for joining us once again. Christina, Tak Sumiket, everyone, please stay safe, be well, and hope to see you all soon. Bye. You can stay, Christina. Thank you, take care.